Okay, whoops. Greetings, everyone. My name is Georgette Mayo, and I'm a processing archivist at the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture. Welcome. I welcome those that are in here in person at the Avery Research Center, those are members online, and those who will view this sometime in the near future. We are honored to have Mrs. Beulah Washington, who facilitated the publication of the book that we will be discussing tonight, From the Farm to the State House to the State Capitol, the McKinley Washington Jr. story. And her good friend, Elder Irene Whaley. I also want to mention my partner in books, the Mrs. Ruth Rambo. We have missed you and are so happy that you are present, even though you're not online right now, but hopefully you're looking at this on YouTube. And we're so happy that you're on the road to recovery. For those who are new to our book club, the Dr. Consuela Francis Reading Circle is named after the former College of Charleston English professor who established the African American Studies program as a major field of study at the college. Dr. Francis created a book club entitled Dart After Dark at the John L. Dart Library on King Street through the uh, Charleston County Public Library. She passed away suddenly in 2016, and we have renamed the Reading Circle in her honor and memory. And I'm proud to say that we have several members that used to attend the Dart After Dark and they're dedicated members to the Dr. Consuela Francis Reading Circle. So thank you for being our dedicated members. We usually meet on the third Thursday of the month. October's book will be James McBride's latest book, The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store. Our discussion will be on October the 19th via Zoom, 6.30 to 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. We are in the backdrop of the works of talented artists with, the, with our newly installed exhibit entitled Nora, Studies in Black Portraiture in our famous McKinley Washington Junior Auditorium at the Avery Research Center. This auditorium was dedicated on July the 28th, 1999. And we do have a plaque, which I will go ahead and read. And this plaque was installed on that installation date. This auditorium, is dedicated to the Reverend McKinley Washington Jr., who as a state senator and distinguished citizen has served the low country and state of South Carolina with loyalty and tireless energy. The purchase and renovation of this magnificent auditorium was made possible through the efforts of Sen Senator Washington. McKinley Washington Jr enjoyed a special place in the hearts of those who attended Avery Normal School and a grateful College of Charleston. Senator Washington has been a courageous leader who has gained the respect of his peers and gratitude of his constituents through his dedication, hard work, and ethical standards and statesmanship. And it's definitely highlighted in this book that we will be discussing tonight. I must mention that there is a wonderful oral history on the Reverend Dr. McKinley Washington and it's online, it's available to anybody anywhere through our Low Country Digital Library and it's called Capturing the History of Edisto Island Oral History Interview with Reverend McKinley Washington and it was done in 2015. 
So you, it's not a visual. It, there is a transcript that you could read along with, but you will hear from, from what I've heard, his booming voice, which he is very noted for. Now we will turn our focus at the book at hand, which is a fitting tribute book to the man, to a man who was the epitome of, of com, public and community service, the Reverend Dr. McKinley Washington, Jr. I, what we usually do when we, we have a reading circle, then we usually meet online. We always start off with the author who wrote the book. So I will do a very short bio of his, of, of Mr. James L. Felder. James L. Felder has spent his life working for justice as a civil rights activist and South Carolina legislator. A native of Sumter, South Carolina, Felder spent his early adult years in Washington, D.C. and has lived in Columbia, South Carolina since 1967. In 1970, Felder was one of the first three black men elected to the South Carolina legislature since reconstruction. In 1973, he began, he became the first African-American assistant solicitor in South Carolina. Among more than 200 awards and honors, Felder is a member of the South Carolina Black Hall of Fame and the Clark Atlanta University Atlantic Athletic Hall of Fame. He continues to lecture at colleges and universities and has written several books, including I Buried John F. Kennedy's Civil Rights in South Carolina and the Making of AME Bishop. He is a steward pro temp at Union Station AME Church in Sumter, and he lives in he's, and he lives in Columbia with two children and two grandsons. And Again, we will be discussing his latest book. And we will begin by, we have several questions to ask Mrs. Washington to start us off. And so I will make myself comfortable at this chair right here. Get set up. And then after the questions, we'll go ahead and, and open it up to our participants in the audience. Now with, first time with new shoes with uh, doing this online. So bear with me. I'm not all that certain that I can actually see our participants that are on Zoom. So yeah, our illustrious, Executive Director, Dr. Tamara Butler, is coming to the stage to, to help a sister out. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Testing. I have a loud voice anyway, so I'm quite sure there's no problem with people with actually hearing me. But I will go ahead and attempt to turn this on. Okay. There you go. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, Mrs. Washington, I definitely want to thank you for initiating the publication of this book and for being with us tonight. This is the first time that I think we've actually met. Yes. And where are my trusty questions? This is, this is, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened to my questions. Can I see your questions? <laughs> okay. I did several, luckily I did several questions beforehand on the assistance of Mrs. Washington and I definitely appreciate that. So you're, you're keeping me on task, so. There you go. <laughs> I knew I had them, but <laughs> yes, I do process archives. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of the questions that I, I'm going to be asking is for me and hopefully for everybody else's clarification, some things that I didn't think that was highlighted in the book. So if you could, if you could help us out. Uh, was Reverend Washington the oldest, middle, or youngest among his siblings? First, I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much for coming this evening for this uh, book discussion. Uh, it means so much to me. And I would just like to say that uh, I hope that you are going to enjoy the book. And uh, please let me know whether or not you enjoy the book. I'm sure you are, but thank you so much for coming. Okay, Reverend McKinley Washington Jr. was born in Maysville, South Carolina to Maddie Bell Peterson Washington and McKinley Washington Jr. He was the third child in the family. Um, and uh, the next question you have, you wanna know his fondest memory? No, I, uh, I, I asked, was he the, the oldest, the middle or the youngest? He was the third child out of eight he children. Okay. Okay. Wait a minute. Yeah. Okay. And because all the all the children weren't listed in the book, right? Okay. I can give you the names of all. <laughs> she knows. Well, yes. Okay. The first one was Ezekiel. Um, the second one was Catherine. McKinley, the third child. Benjamin, the fourth. Richard, the fifth. Elijah, I'm sorry, James the sixth, Virginia the seventh, and Elijah the eighth, the youngest one. Okay, thank you. You are noted as saying about your, your marriage, that this is in the book, that we are still on a honeymoon. What is your advice for fulfilling marriage? I have to laugh at that one. Um, <laughs> I've noted for saying that, uh, you know, that we're still on the honeymoon, but I didn't expect it to be in the book. I think he told Jim Felder to put it in the book. But anyway, I think that a marriage, you got to communicate with each other. That's the one of the main thing is to communicate. Uh, then you listen to each other in your conversations, you know. Uh, you, whatever the subject is about, take a part in it, and 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 the two of you talk about things together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you seek advice. You're a partner. You're friends. You're in this marriage. Who's better to go to for advice? I know I was a good person for him to come to me for advice, <laughs> and he was an excellent person for me to go to for advice. And, and uh, I think that that's one of the other things. And, and one other thing is praising each other. That's wonderful to do, is to say, you know, after his sermons on Sunday, maybe I slept a little bit, but I said, you had a great sermon, <laughs> a wonderful sermon today. Always, I always told him about his sermons. And uh, whatever meetings we go to, he conducted meetings. I said, you did a great job, you know. You did a wonderful job. And he would do the same thing with me. 50 years and 59 years we did that. 
And uh, that's why we're still on the honeymoon. We were still on the honeymoon until death. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. That's so inspiring. Oh, yeah. In this day and age, if I have to add that. So, so thank you for sharing that. Now on to politics. While reading about the former governor, Ernest F. Hollings, his actions reminded me of this quote, and I don't know exactly who wrote this quote, otherwise I would have put it in, but maybe some of you might have heard it and perhaps you know who, who this, this quote is by. In politics, there are no permanent friends, nor no permanent enemies, only permanent interest. Do you think Reverend Washington held this belief? Well, uh, as far as having permanent enemies or any enemies, McKinley didn't have any enemies. No one could do any wrong in his sight. He upheld everybody to the standards and he just loved people. And um, whatever they did, right or wrong to him, he would pray about it, accept it, and continue to love that person and do thus what is right. So um, I don't think that, um, you know, uh, uh, that as far as politics is concerned, he didn't have any enemies as far as I know. There were probably some out there, but I don't know about it. I don't know either because looking through this, reading through this book, Reverend Dr. Washington Jr. knew more people and they all had glowing things to say about him. That, that, that's what really amazed me about this, this tribute book. I mean, to live a life that he did and the things that he did, the, the people that he touched and what, what captured me that, you know, he, he always looked out for the small person, right. the little person and, and to add to that, um, in the book, you have a number of people, uh, and they, uh, I read the book, and knowing these people, they spoke from their hearts, and they talked exactly about what happened with them and with him during, the, during these times and whatnot. So I'm grateful to each one of you for that. Yes, that's it's, that's why I call this a tribute book, because you know, the people took their time and, and, and wrote, and, and, and as you said, from the heart. Mm -hmm. Now, some other techniques, some other questions that I had in regards to time periods. Uh, do you remember when uh, Reverend Washington's trip to the Middle East was? Um, that trip was in the, in the 80s, 1980, if you know about 85 or something like that. Okay. And, um, um, he uh, went on that trip and he, he actually enjoyed it because it was not, not so much of enjoyment, but the things that he saw and whatnot, biblical places that the Jordan River and other places he had an opportunity to visit. And uh, when he came back, I remember the first time he went back in the pulpit, he said, hmm, that made my sermon come alive today, you know. I can uh, actually associate with the places that I've visited uh, uh, there and everything. And so the places that he'd studied about in seminary and whatnot and read in the Bible, he had an opportunity to visit those places. That's amazing. And what a wonderful opportunity to do that. Was there any events or topics that did not make this book? And if so, what are they? Well, um, the strangest thing, the book says from the farm to the state capitol. But uh, I didn't see very much in there about the farm. And those of you that know him knew that he was a farmer from his heart. Uh, you would see him on the tractor with the suit on. Uh, they didn't talk about the um, garden that he had. He was good for doing a garden uh, any vegetable he could grow it in that garden he had a tractor still has a tractor still there 
And um, he had a goat at one time as well. Chickens, ducks, and all kinds of animals. And sometimes I would have to go feed the animals when I, before I go to work in the morning. And I sort of got tired of that. So. <laughs> when he went to Columbia one day, I gave the, the um, ducks away. <laughs> he came home looking for the ducks. I helped him look for them. <laughs> oh! Then finally I told him what happened. I gave him to a neighbor down the street. But uh, he was all into farming and I you know that would have been something to include more of that. Get up early in the morning and go out there. And these people can attest to that, that uh, he was a farmer mm -hmm. from his heart. Yeah. You never get that dirt to one of the fingernails from Maze Hill that you have there. Always love that. And he loved the fish too. I was a big fish pond. He loved to go out and fish. So um, as well as hunt, he would come back with the birds and the uh, other little animals and whatnot. Just a farmer. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you when you mentioned fishing, a lot of the the quotes from your grandsons are mentioned, and they mentioned the act of going fishing with their grandfather. Uh, yes, we have a fish pond in the yard, and um, that was their time with him. Uh, we have four grandsons, and uh, he would always take them fishing, and they would sometimes say, who's going to get the largest fish or the most fish? And then they would, the granddaddy would give us a prize for that, whatever that we did. And just this past week, um, Labor Day weekend, we had some of the grands to come and they continue to fish. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to be mischievous, mischievous and ask you a question that is not on here. <laughs> uh oh. That was bad. It's not bad. For all the things that the Reverend Dr. McKinley Washington Jr. did, you know, being a, starting off as a, 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 a civil rights activist mm -hmm. and then you know, getting married and then, you know, going into politics and, you know, being a pastor. And how did he find the time to do everything that's listed in his book, <laughs> in his life? I wonder too about that, but um, it, it, somehow he found the time to do the things that in the book, the father, he was a husband, mm -hmm. he was a family person to his, I mean, to his family. He would do anything with the time for his nieces and nephews to go off to college. He would get them in his truck or, or whatever car he had and go with them and take them to school. But he would, he found the time. He just. Maybe he had more than 24 hours in a day, but <laughs> now he I know that he's not an anomaly and and the the generation during that time that was on was within civil rights and you know up to a certain point, they they did they multitasked. They, you know, what we they they probably didn't call it multitasking at the time, but I'm considering it multitasking because they did so many things. I said the same thing about uh, the Honorable Lucille Whipper. I had the good fortune of, of processing her papers and just to say that it's 180 boxes <laughs> of archival materials. And not only is it the House of Representatives, you know, when she was she was a representative, her helping to establish the Avery as what it is today, the archives, small news museum and cultural center for public programming, which we're enjoying right now, uh, being a first lady, which you also were, were the first lady of a pastor and uh, everything else. And it's like, when do you find the time to, to even rest? <laughs> Did he rest? <laughs> yes, 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 as well. But uh, he would get up early in the morning. He had a schedule, I'm sure. 
And uh, we just find time to do all of these things. And, and the thing about it, as he was doing these things, he enjoyed it. He enjoyed working with people. So I guess it didn't seem like uh, overwhelming and a great deal for him to do because this was his life. And uh, he got, uh, if he could see the results of helping someone uh, and it would come to fruition for the person. That was a step for him. And he just enjoyed being a part of it. I never stood in the way of him doing anything for anyone because that was his calling from God and he carried it out very well. So he is the number one lady. <laughs> Sorry. He had to have a number yes. one lady in this corner to be able to accomplish what he did. I mean, Jeff, a lot of credit goes to you as a person with him. Thank you. And that's exactly what what should be in every way. Very supportive. You would have to be. One would have to be. <laughs> so now I'm taking you off the hot seat right now. No, but sit, stay, stay where you are. I'm going to open it up. But I wanted to mention some of the um, the tributes that's in this book, and we're fortunate enough to have. Uh, you're you're deemed as elder um, Eileen Whaley in the book, but I don't look at you as an elder. <laughs> <laughs> that's not to say that you're not but i'm just saying you you're beautiful so it's just yeah you don't yeah but i know that is a form of respect the sign of respect so i want to open it up to you and your um you you were quoted in this book and i want to um if i can find you other, other, Thank you for the per There you go. I'll go ahead and read it and I'd love you for, for you to, to elaborate. You wrote, Senator McKinley Washington was God called. He was most giving and he believes in people. He took care of his past, his parishioners. He is the most approachable person I have ever met. Thank you. Before I answer, I too would like to say thank you for the opportunity to be here and to speak on behalf of um, Reverend Washington from his book. Um, my name is Irene Whaley. I have been a member, and I still am, a member of Edisto Presbyterian Church for 40 something years. And I have known Reverend Washington all of those 40 something years plus more. Reverend Washington had a spirit that was so calming so caring, so welcoming. And like I said in a book, he was so approachable. You could talk to him about anything. He was more than a minister to us. Um, he listened, he gave us positive feedback. He pushed us, he encouraged us. He made us understand that, you know, we can, with God's help, we can do all thing. And we appreciate him for that. I can remember um, when I became an officer in the, in the church, and we would go to um, presbytery meetings and stuff, presbytery meetings. And all of that was new to me. And uh, we would sit next to Reverend Washington and he would, as we sat there, he would tell us exactly what was going on and how and what we needed to do as we participated in, in those meetings. 
always gave us an opportunity to, um, he gave us an opportunity to do different things. He took us, he took us um, on speaking engagements. We went to New York. He, he spoke in New York City and we went to Washington, D.C. and he took us a lot. He took us there. He, actually, he gave us exposure, you know, coming from a little island, Edisto Island. It was nice to be exposed to those things. And um, we also participated with him and um, a lot of things that he was recognized for in the community. Even when this room here was dedicated to him, we were here with him. Um, but Reverend Washington, he gave so much of himself, not just to his family, but of course, his family was number one, but he gave to everyone. And he believed in, he believed in people. He just looked for the best in everyone. And that's why we love him so much and we miss him so much. And, um, and as I read this, as I read this book, you know, I was like really in awe because, you know, when I look at the comments that other comments that was made in reference to what kind of person he was and how he touched other people's lives. I'm like, you know, this is, this is so true. And I've lived with him doing, you know, he was my pastor this time during these times. So I feel so special to have been a part of his life for so long. Thank you for, for Stephanie sharing that. That's wonderful. And then elaborating. Mm -hmm. Anybody else that's in this book that would like to elaborate? These two um, right here from his church as well. Would you? These are church members here. Would, would you like oh, to speak? Yes. I'm putting you on the spot. Thank you. And your name? Robert Bowens. I'm on page 124. Thank you. Ms. Washington said something earlier about no one did any wrong in Reb's eyes. And back in my days, I'm telling you, that man, you know, I said he's, and he has been, he's been more than a father for, to me. No matter what I've done, it doesn't, didn't matter to him, my past, whatever. He's been there with me, it seemed like all my life. He's been a godsend to me. And I, I can't thank him enough. I can never repay him for all he's done for me. Thank you. And you can pass it on. Would you like to speak? Oh, okay, yes. Not two hours. <laughs> it won't be too much. <laughs> He's always speaking at me. First of all, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Carlette Geddes, and I am a member of Edisto Presbyterian Church. Um, I grew up only knowing Reverend Washington as a pastor. When he um, retired, after 50 years, I am 57. So this is, that's the only past I knew. Mm. So um, I can just remember being a little girl and, you know, he would be preaching and his voice was like thunderous, you know, powerful. And, um, you know, he just planted seeds in us. He believed in us, the young people of the church, um, built, help us keep our faith. Um, I can remember um, having our catechism class with him and he would teach the class, not anybody but him. And he would give us lessons. He would explain stuff that we didn't know. And as we got older, he evolved us with politics too as well. Um, talking about the NAACP, what it stood for and just, you know, honing us in and trying to make sure that we got what we needed to, you know, be better citizens in society. Um, I can remember like graduating from um, high school and saying I was going to college. And then he mentioned Johnson C. Smith. And I said, well, my uncle is in something. They want to send me to Morris College. So he says, that where you want to go? I said, not really, but <laughs> I, I guess I have to go. But anyway, he gave me words of encouragement, telling me to go to college, be all I can be, get a good education. Um, 
keep God first, remember all of the teachings that he instilled in me. And I took that with me when I went off to college. And um, when I came back, um, I think I left again and moved to Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I kept calling him because I could not find a church like my home church. Couldn't find a pastor like him. So he sent me on all these different churches. He sent me to one church in College Park that had over 3,000 members. I called him and said, Reverend Washington, I never even met the preacher. I can't go back there. So he said, okay, let me send you to another church. So he sent me to another church on Glendale. And then I called in that afternoon and I was crying. He said, what you crying for? I said, well, the preacher cried all through his sermon. And he I, I said, he was crying. And I said, so I'm all upset. And he said, well, why was he crying? I said, he was just talking about his cancer journey. And I just started getting so emotional. So I've been crying. And so to make a long story short, Reverend Washington said, I think you just want to come back home. <laughs> and so, so eventually I did come back home because my grandmother was six. I was helping my mom. But let me go further. So um, I told Reverend Washington I was getting, you know, was getting married. And so he said, well, now we need to meet this gentleman. Make sure we check him out. Make sure you're somebody you need to marry. <laughs> and so I told him he was from Johns Island and then he knew some of the people and we went through our marriage classes with Reverend Washington. And so he married us in 1998. And in 2000, we welcomed a little girl and he baptized her. And so while I, while I was passing her to Reverend Washington during the service, I had this long gown on her that went like across your arm. And so when I was giving her to Reverend Washington, Reverend Washington, why you got this long gown on this girl? And I said, this is the style. This is how, he said, this is too long. This is what he's saying at the christening now. And he's trying to gather the little girl and all of the gown at the same time. And it was, my mama told me too, she said, I think that was really too much. But anyway, so he, he baptized her. Mm. She grew up under him and, um, just when he retired, I think they joined the church and he was in church that Sunday and Reverend Haywood allowed him to, to come up and be a part of that ceremony. And it was just beautiful. So he's always been a part of our lives and we, we miss him dearly. So he's been, he's been there for me through thick and thin when my father died. I called him and, you know, he was talking to me, trying to encourage me. And um, I think y'all were out of town, Miss Washington, when, when my father died. And um, he called me and told me, I need you to be strong. And, you know, you know, your dad loved you. And so he was just always encouraging me. But he's been a very, very important part of our lives. My husband, my life, and my daughters. That's wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. Was that Anybody else? <laughs> That's fine. No, I'm with you. no, you've had an experience with him. So thank you. Share. And absolutely decades of experience. Um, I'm Foshe Shepherd, and I met Reverend Washington when I was living on Bayside. And when I got involved, when I got involved with him because he, I was working for Danny Martin Sr.'s law firm, and they were very good friends. And so he um, encouraged me um, to join Toastmasters International because I kept telling them that I had so much I wanted to say. And Mr. Martin was saying, yeah, and she needs to learn how to say. <laughs> so anyway, um, his first move was to introduce me to um, Mrs. Um, Hilda Jefferson. Mm -hmm. And he said, y'all don't live far from each other. He said, I want you to go over to her house. I'm going to let her know that I'm sending her to your house, sending you to her house. I want you to go over to her house and you want her to be your mentor. And so when I got off that evening, I went over to her house and it started from there. Um, she took me under her wings and it started from there. And, and then I started going to um, city council, county council meetings, legislative delegations. And then when, when he, when, when, when Chief Greenberg decided that I should become the representative for my community and 
Reverend Ken McKinley Washington told him that he would be working with me if I was willing to, to do the work. He told me it was gonna be hard. Um, he told me it was challenging working with your own people and especially people who know you well because then they know you on one level and they can't, a lot of times they can't see you on a different level from what they know you as. He said, but if you're willing to work and, and you're willing to learn, then I'll work with you. And he did. He would come on Bayside and, and um, <laughs> he'd have conferences with my mother, telling my mother what she should do to help me to get ready to, to be able to go into the community. He had made, made sure that I stayed in Toastmasters International. But not only that, um, I'm sure he never said it, but I'm sure he and Congressman Clyburn were responsible for me being on the African-American history calendar. I never knew who nominated me and who worked to get me on that calendar. But I know they usually start with 120 nominees and it's the last 12 persons, they narrow it down to 12 people before they're on the calendar. So I know that and they had me as the first scholar poet and that was in for the 1997 calendar. But then um, he also had me to run for office. And so he had me run for the school board. I failed the first time. He said, you can't give up. He said, you got to go out there. He said, you, you are concerned about the children and y'all have over 300 children in Bayside. And, you, and if you are talking about what these children need help, then you need to be a spokesperson. You need to be out there to help make decisions. So I ran again. And so um, this time I got elected to the District 20 School Board and I worked and, and then I really think that because I made such a noise on the board, um, I think that's how I got nominated. I didn't get nominated, I just got appointed to the Foster Care Review Board. And I contacted Reverend McKinley Washington and I said, I don't understand what's happening. He said, well, they don't want you to run again. He said, but I'll support you and the legislature. He said, and I will share what I know about you to the legislators and the delegation. And he said, you just go ahead. He said, and so Nikki Haley went ahead and appointed me. So that got me to keep me from running again for the school board for re-election. But when it came up, when the regular election time came up and I had to go before the legislative delegation, Reverend McKinley Washington already had everybody, all of the legislators. They didn't even know me because I never submitted an application because they just got me out of the school board and pointed me there. But because it was the foster care review board um, and my passion for children, then I was in the right place and he made sure that all of those legislators, every last one of them signed for me to be nominated to be on the Foster Care Review Board. And I'm still on this board. And this is my, um, this is my fourth um, re-election, reappointment coming up now. But Reverend McKinley Washington was the backbone, the initiative with everything and taught me about politics because I didn't know and understand about it. But that's the way he was. And, and I was on Bayside and Bayside was the most high risk crime area in the community. And nobody, they didn't even want to associate with people from Bayside and let alone. And he saw the potential in me that I didn't even see in myself and came up through Bayside and brought me out and now out among everybody. <laughs> so, anybody else? Thanks, Ms. Boucher. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Hi. I'm Kathy Green. I'm from Hebron Zion Presbyterian Church uh, on Johns Island. Uh, I think I met McKinley, Reverend McKinley, uh, when he first came to Hebron Zion as a stated pastor. And they said, we're getting a state of pastor. So I said, okay. I didn't know Reverend McKinley because I had moved from Johns Island to New York. Then I moved back. But the one thing that caught my attention, beside him being Parato, which I always teased him about that, was his voice. When he opened his mouth, you all memorize. You do not move 
it was like you were in a tension, mm. but you remember everything that he said. And I keep telling them, I said, Reverend Washington, I said, you keep this up. I think you can talk some of the dead people back alive. Because if he wanted you to do something, he encouraged you. And five minutes, if you said no, two minutes, you're going to say yes. And myself and Renee Garrett, we would be in the office when he comes in to the church. I don't think, I don't think Reverend McKinley ever got in his office enough. He stayed out in the front office and he made jokes the whole time. Or oh, he had a story to tell us. When he comes to the church and he doesn't leave, I said, Ms. Washington got a, a, what do you call a thing where you can trace the people, keep track of them. She has a tracker on that car. So I think you need to go back home. But he was a loving person. I miss him. And I keep telling Ms. Washington that was my parato boyfriend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Renee Garrett from Hebron Zion Presbyterian Church as well. When Reverend McKinley came to Hebron Zion, I was on session as an elder. I was slated to come off and I stayed on because I knew with 50 years of experience that I could still learn a lot. And I did in more ways than one. It was interesting because during that time we had a office administrator who uh, resigned and I ended up, I got a call from him you need to come here right now. And I said, okay, give me a minute and I'll be there. I was at home. So I walked into his office and he explained the situation. I said, but don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get it done. That's when I took on the role of administrative assistant for the church. I'm still there. <laughs> Under his leadership, when he came, we had a mortgage, but under his leadership, he befriended a person who was instrumental in helping us pay off our mortgage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am eternally grateful. Because when you go a small church and you're getting smaller and smaller, it's really hard to have a mortgage and the majority of the money is going to the mortgage because we really weren't paying. We really weren't paying him what he was worth. But he took on the road and he stayed there with us and we got the mortgage paid off. And we had, he said, okay, now y'all can call the pastor. I think he was really happy <laughs> that he could go back into retirement. But anyway, he was a joy to work with. I really enjoyed it. Um, he used to kid me all the time. He said, uh, since I was a volunteer, I wasn't a paid employee. He always kid me. He said, well, what I was working this week? I said, <laughs> I'll get it done. Don't worry. I never gave him any hours. <laughs> that went on for what, about three years? <laughs> I never gave him any hours. And so anyway, we, we got it done. Like I promised him, I told him, I said, we'll get it done. And that's what we did. We got it done. He was a joy to work with. Um, like Rosie said, he was, um, he would come in um, we spent more time chatting and what have you, but it was just a pleasure. It was, it was just fun. Um, and, but you learned a lot from him. He taught you a lot. Um, he was very knowledgeable and more things than one, but the most interesting thing I remember about him that I found out was that he was a bus driver and I knew how fast Reverend Washington drove. <laughs> 
And I know, like I said, when he came, I was an elder and we would, went to give communion and Ms. Washington was in the car. And I told him, I said, well, Washington, you need to slow down because I'm not sure where the person's house is. Well, we got there before I realized it. He slammed on brakes and I went on the floor. <laughs> I will never forget that. <laughs> but anyway, like I said, and I always tease him about it. I said, you need to slow down. And he said, and he always called us. He always said, okay, daughter. Okay, daughter. And like I said, he was just a wonderful person to work with and know. And he loved everybody. You could do no wrong in his eyes. He just loved you to death. Thank you. Good evening. My name is M. Ann Cook, and I am an alum of Johnson C. Smith University, of which Pastor Washington was also. And I'm not sure, but I think there is a connection with our newly appointed president, who is from Charleston. And she's also a graduate of Johnson C. Smith University as well, located in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it might be all of perhaps a month. And I say that duration because on August 19th, we had a fundraiser, the Charleston chapter did, as a part of scholarship proceeds. And Dr. Valerie Kinlaw is her name. She lives here on the peninsula. And her mother still resides in what we just call the terrace up in uh, Hampton Park and Wagner Terrace. And I said all that to say this by having her, Dr. Uh, Kinlaw, attend our day party. She actually opened the floor to anyone that might have had any thoughts, any questions for her. And in that light, that reminded me of Dr. McKinley Washington, because he was always approachable, was never above reproach, always had, I would say, an open door policy. And Dr. Kinlaw impresses me as being that type of newly appointed president of Johnson C. Smith University. And uh, Sarah Beulah is my sorority sister of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Wow, now I have two mics. <laughs> I'm going to turn oh this one God. off. What also really impresses me with, with people in the book and, and your testimonies is that not only is he a caring person, I mean, I wrote down some of the adjectives and it was like I was running out of space because <laughs> I was going to mention them. But I think that, you know, having you here and, and, and bringing these testimonies to life, you know, from out of the book and, and into our ears. Uh, one of the things, the many things that really impressed me, because keep in mind, I've, I've been with Avery for 17 and a half years, and I'm, I'm always proud to say that. But I've only met him twice. <laughs> but from the reading and from what you were saying, Ms. Shepard, in regards to involvement in, in politics, and I think also that he wasn't an anomaly during that, that time period because people knew how crucial, you know, the, the ability to vote and not only for your president and your, 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 your higher elected, but the, the people that have your every, you deal with every day, your school board and your sheriff. And yeah, the people that, that really enact laws that can hurt, can to, to help you, but most likely hinder you. And for Reverend Dr. Washington to encourage people to vote and, 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 and be involved in politics is a powerful thing and something that I think we take for granted today. Not us here, because we know, 
but I mean, if we could share that with, with the younger people. Yes, Ms. Shepard. Same too. I mean, you did not, you just said it's wrong. Thank you. It was nothing, and I'm telling you, want to see something proud to be up in the chambers in Columbia and and to see him on the floor with these bills and dealing with these. He was teaching, he was teaching these politicians uh, about how to be human, to look at people as humans, and he would stand his ground. I want to tell you, we saying good things about him, and and, and we're talking about that soft part, but I'm telling you. He would always be able to stand up for what he believed in and what was right. And nobody, nobody um, would be able to move him from his belief. And he fought for so many people. People have no idea. I don't know, but Mrs. Washington would know how many sleepless nights he had being concerned about people because he was really concerned about people and people who were suffering. That's the main thing. I mean, if you saw him among people who were suffering and how he treated them with such humanity, then you would be able to get a picture of who he is. But everybody else know, those politicians know everybody knew that if Reverend McKinley Washington brought something, a matter, he's gonna stand for that matter. And I know he was able to get so many laws written that made a difference in all the communities, but particularly the rural communities and in neighborhoods like mine that was high risk crime areas. Thank you. And, and I think too in the book it said somewhere um, that he he would deal with people with his heart and his head. And I I've just turned to page seventy one seventeen, and um, it really shows you how selfless he was and how much he cared and loved people. And he was a different kind of politician. You know, he just had a heart of gold. It says of the numerous accomplishment that he had, and there were many. And he was so proud of the Sea Island Comprehensive Healthcare Corporation. And that, and you know why he was so proud of that, because it was for the people. It served the people that could not afford health care. It um, provided a nursing home for people who got sick, who had nowhere to go, had no one to take care of them, no family members. You know, this, these things speaks volume about who Reverend Washington was. And his second accomplishment that he was so proud of, above all of the hundreds others that he had, was the bridge connecting Edisto with um, the mainland. And that's because, you know, that Dahu Bridge, I think he said in his book, the old bridge that they took out, he said um, some times when he was leaving Edisto that, that he too had to use the hand crank to close the bridge. And we can remember when we would leave at a store, sometimes we would be late getting to school because of that bridge. But, you know, the bridge connected us to the other part of the world, his bridge that was built in 1993. And that was for the people, again, to make sure that everybody had access to things that they needed. So we could really go on and on and talk about Reverend Washington tonight. He has done so much for so many. And for that, we are ever so grateful to him. And we are grateful to Mrs. Washington. Yes, uh -huh. we love you. It only could take me 30 seconds. I got to add something. You know, when Reverend Washington speaks, it's like everybody listens. You know, he nominated me to be, the, to be the worshipful master of my large some years ago. And he was so supportive. And my daughter graduated from Winthrop University. Of course, you know, Reverend Washington was there in North Carolina. 
Someone talk about his driving. I went with him one night to a Masonic funeral in Columbia, and it was raining and dark. And I wanted to drive so bad. Y'all got the story. This has been a wonderful tribute, a living tribute. And I know I believe in when you pass, your spirit lives on, it never dies. And I know that his that the Reverend Dr. McKinley Washington Jr. spirit is with us right now. So I want to thank everybody. Any final words from anybody else? Anybody that wanted to say something? Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll catch, we're gonna we'll okay right we're gonna do that in a, we're, right after we're this. gonna do that in a couple of minutes but we're, we're gonna let mrs washington close us out and before before i give the mic over to her i want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to being here tonight and also everybody that is watching on zoom or youtube now or in the future, thank you so much. It's been, a, it's been an honor and a pleasure to help facilitate. And Mrs. Washington, thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a great, great book discussion this evening. I even learned something about my husband. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say to all of you and all of those that are out there watching, thank you so much you just don't know the part that you played in his life that you were there for him and he enjoyed working with each one of you and nothing was ever too hard for him to do uh he had certain things sea island was his heart and there were other things alpha by alpha fraternity and uh the masons and we can just go on and name so many things that he was so dear to and worked so hard to accomplish so much. And to all of the persons that made comments in the book, I want to say thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. And I love each one of you. Thank you. Bye -bye. And we'd love to honor you with these roses. And Mrs. Whaley, <laughs> Mrs. Whaley almost facilitated tonight. So <laughs> Mrs. Washington spoke so highly of you. So I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but, <laughs> but, but thank you. And thank you everybody for coming again and for sharing and have a good evening. And don't let this be your last time to visit us at the Avery Research Center for African-American History and Culture and Ms. Shepard. Um, well, this is great. And this is the last exhibit for it just came up. Oh no. <laughs> yes. This is oh no, we're we're getting ready to go in there. Yeah. In in in, in into the McKinley, Washington. Okay. Okay. I have a I, I have a way for Margaret. So the only thing I want to say welcome and thank you all for coming. Uh we're gonna go into this exhibit there is there is up but it's all on loan and so as uh mrs georgia mayo pointed out earlier she's a processing archivist so on your way out whether you take the stairs or the elevator i want you to stop on the second floor because she mentioned lucille simmons whipper right and i want you to see what Ms. mayo processed because it's one thing to say 150 boxes it's another thing to see 150 boxes and then because uh, Mrs. Washington and I have been talking about this, what does it look like? So you mentioned Valerie Kinlock. She was my, dis my dissertation mentor, uh, doctoral advisor. And so we also co-authored a book together. So we're trying to build a partnership with Johnson C. Smith. Um, and so with that, we want to think about what goes to Johnson C. Smith, what lives here, and what will live with Black Presbytery or Presbytery Church um, collection. And so... When you go in here, think about if you also have 
items and memories and things that you would like for generations and generations beyond this book um, and beyond us to see. And so just go in there and get an idea. And then when you're done, you're more than welcome to join me. And I want to show you this wall of archives that's done by hand. There's no AI in the making of, of what you see there. So thank you all so much.